Welcome everyone to uh, another discussion on strategy and strategic thinking. Um, here with, with Tom Garrity. And Tom uh, is the, the managing director of Compass Point Consulting. You're in a great position to talk about strategy with, with your many clients. Why don't you introduce uh, yourself and your firm? Sure, thank you, Jamie. Uh, I'm Tom Garrity with Compass Point Family Business Consulting. We've been in business for about 18 years. Uh, started this business, I, I uh, grew up in family business, so that was a piece of it for sure. Uh, ended up in my career working for three different family businesses, but never, I didn't go to work for any one of them thinking, oh, I really want to work for a family business. And it wasn't thinking I don't want to, it just landed in them uh, and found that I really enjoyed um, sort of getting into the mix of what turns out to be a lot of what we do today. And that's that family governance work along with the strategic planning and the succession planning. Um, so 18 years today, we work with, uh, I'll say 98% of our clients are in that family business space, somewhere between five and hundred million in revenues. Um, they wanna grow. So that's pretty important. If they don't wanna grow, we're probably not a good answer. Uh, and they're multi-generational, right? They're trying to get to the next gen either with their next gen of family and or just position the business so it has value. So if it's time to get out of that particular business and maybe redeploy capital in another direction, it's also a good place we like to be because that's gonna be very strategic. Um, so there's, there's three of us, we're actually working right now and bringing on the fourth person. Uh, we're located in the Lehigh Valley, Pennsylvania, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. So we work up to COVID about a 90 mile radius. And now of course we've all learned how to do this. So we've got clients outside of that region as well, fitting into that five to $100 million parameter. So happy to be here today and have this conversation. Great. Well, it's uh, yeah, really interesting when you talk about family businesses, because as you kind of indicated, you know, you need a, a strategy for the family to family, generation to generation transitions. Um, an awful lot of family businesses didn't start with a strategy. They just started with a product or a service. And then as new generations or other pivots come about, then strategic thinking almost has to come back into the, the business, even though it wasn't started as a strategy exercise. So um, very interesting background to be, to be thinking about uh, strategy in an environment where it's not always explicit. Um, so, you know, for starters, how, how do you define strategy? What does strategy really look like from, from your purview? Yeah, uh, you know, and so, so I'll, I'll, I'll lean on Michael Porter from, from Harvard Business School, who uses the definition strategy being that unique and valuable position, quote unquote, different from our competitors, right? What's unique and valuable about what we're doing that's different from our competitors. Either we do things completely differently or we do things differently than our competitors. The reason is because if you don't do that, you're gonna be in a commodity game. It's gonna be all about price and really only one person can win in that. And that's the low cost provider can play in the low price game. And you know you can't do that unless you've got scale. And in that, that arena that we play in, um, they don't have the money, uh, the, the, either the bandwidth or the, the capital to go out and build the kind of infrastructure to have that kind of scale to be low cost provider. Um, so we're in, we're in that sort of value add space, which is primarily most businesses. Well, they should be. A lot of them don't strategically think like that. And then they end up in that commodity game without knowing they're in there and they get in a trap. Um, so unique and valuable position. And again, that little caveat of that it's different from our competitors and unique and valuable to who? To the customer, right? We can be enamored with a really neat idea, but if the market doesn't care, it's just a neat idea. So uh, unique and valuable to the customer. And again, that, that, that different from our competitors. Yeah, I think that, that, that different and that unique, those, those things become pretty important. And uh, you know, lots of people can see a, a business opportunity, but as I, especially when I coach, say, say student entrepreneurs, I, I love to ask them, well, why are you, what's so special about you that you're the one to solve this problem, right? It's, and there's, there's a good answer in there somewhere, but, but uh, unless you can define what's, what's unique, what's different, then you're just, you know, one other person chasing the same problem with the same solution. So I think that's, that's pretty important. 
Um, so as you think about strategy with yourself as well as your clients, do you, do you see it as more of a, a process, a, a decision uh, of, of positioning, et cetera, or, or is it a perpetual way of thinking? Yeah, you know, of course this has evolved in, in doing this work. Um, when I worked in the family business, first one I started in, I, I was just growing up, I was you know, in a management training program, went through, ended up opening up distribution for that company and, and then ultimately got in the sales group. The second two companies, I was the president of those manufacturing companies. And you know, it was also where I got introduced to strategy. Now I have PL responsibility and, and along with all this family dynamic going on. And um, I was, I honestly, when I was first starting, I had strategic thinking, strategic planning, strategy kind of all in the same bucket. And what I've come to understand is they're very distinct. You know, strategy is that a sort of positioning statement. It's a thing. It's a thing. We get to it. It's a strategy. But strategic thinking, uh, from my standpoint anyway, and it's what we really work hard with our companies to think about or to, to get that thinking. It's what goes on all the rest of the time, right? It's a mindset. It's a mindset of once we have an understanding of where we're trying to go, you know, so in that strategy, you know, where's the vision and Kind of where in our, our process, what are the key thrusts over the next three years? What are we going to do this year? But once we have some feel of that, that 10 year, 20 year vision, that BHAG, um, now we get people thinking about well, what's possible in that and, and what are our competitors doing and what do our customers want? And it's all that thinking that goes on outside of the normal business hours that when we come together, then I'll do some planning. It's too late to do the thinking. The thinking has had to go on, right? So that thinking is a process. It's an ongoing process. It's never, if it's done well, it's never done. Um, some of us have to learn how to turn it off and shut down at night and not do it all the time. But honestly, you get a company that is full of strategic thinkers. Um, what we tell clients when we first start working with them is, we'll find, you probably are gonna find it's gonna be a lot harder to figure out what to say no to than saying yes to. There will be an abundance of things that are like, oh, these are all great ideas, but we can't do them all. What are we gonna say no to? What are we gonna focus on? So, you know, again, I, I, the thinking and the planning is a process. We get to a strategy, to a, 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 an executable, you know, document, a statement, uh, uh, not just a statement, of course, uh, that plan that now we execute. So they're both involved and they're both critical, right? You go to a strategic planning and you haven't done any thinking, there's gonna be probably a lot of sitting around, you know, probably pretty theoretical, come out with not anything very effective, quite frankly. Um, so that's that's our process is very much of getting them engaged early on before we would even come together. Voice of the customer, voice of the employees, a uh, little competitive analysis, confronting the brutal facts, you know, well, how, what have we been doing? What's, what's our performance over the last three years? What's revenue and cash and profit? Um, what are our customer concentrations? What's the 80-20? How much of our business is coming from probably 20% of our customers? That, you know, getting a feel of that. And where's the profitability? So now you're looking at all those things, process, and now coming in to start saying, all right, where are we going to try to go? What, now that we know this, we have a little understanding what the customer's needs are, where they where they where we can bring value um, and then start planning, you know, based on that to ultimately come out with a plan that we can execute. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so, you know, building on that, uh, I always find this interesting, uh, uh, to especially talking the difference between say an, uh, an entrepreneur or a business owner and someone who's a consultant or advisor, because you, you're not in the business all the time. You, you don't get to, manage the uh, no, late night thought process, right? Um, and so you have, you have sort of strategic planning, which is you know, easier, so to speak, to engage in as, as, as a, a consultant and advisor. But as you indicated, the thinking happens you know, sometimes before all that. So perhaps especially as someone coming in and helping from the outside, how do you, I'll, I'll say both distinguish, but also integrate the, the strategic thinking from the strategic planning. Yeah, so um, it, 
you got to be careful that you don't bring a fire hose in, right? I mean, you, you, it's be so easy to overwhelm people with all of the brilliance and all of the all of the the theory and etc. There certainly needs to be some context, and so um, our style is uh, helping prepare the team. So literally having some one-to-one -one conversations before we're going to go off-site to do the planning, right? And in that we're talking about, hey, what do you think is we're doing really well in the company? What should we stop doing? What should we keep doing? What should we start doing? Um, you know, if, if budget wasn't an issue, what do you think is an initiative change? Start getting them to start thinking freely without limitations. We also do that so we can start building some trust. Maybe they might tell us something that they go, ooh, I don't know if I want to say that. And they find out, yeah, we're not taking that anywhere other than to have more insight into the business. Mm -hmm. Build trust, people are more vulnerable, they'll share better, we'll have better discussions. Uh, and really break through some of the probably challenges that are in uh, in the business. Um, so it's 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 sort of teeing it up and and being patient with people's um, pace. Some people are going to pick up on it a little bit quicker than others. Mm -hmm. Some people are real resistant. You know the classic: we don't do it that way. Stuff we've always done it this way. Um, it's just patiently moving them through. Um, one of the things we do early on is talking about the risk of not, um, I don't wanna say just change. You should never change for change's sake, but but if we're not growing to some extent, and, and that doesn't mean just revenue, right? It just means growth as an organization. If it's if we're not innovating our products or our services, if we're not innovating how we uh, deliver, if we're, not, if we're not innovating with how we go to market, if, if we're just relying on how we did it, we're gonna get eaten up. There's just no question. You can only, I use the analogy on a bike. You, on a bicycle, you can only coast indefinitely if you're going downhill. And it's the same thing in a business. You can coast for a while and you don't notice it until one day you wake up and go, geez, what happened? Where did they come from? Mm -hmm. So start introducing that to people that we've got to be thinking, recognizing what's going on in the market, um, paying attention, asking the questions, um, watch what's happening in the adjacent industries, uh, talking to your competitors. Some people, you know, oh, can you never talk to your competitor? Yeah, you can. <laughs> Find ways to talk to them. You, 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 you just get curious um, and, and you start learning. And again, then that starts, you know, looking at where you're trying to take your business with some of that thinking piece that you've done. Again, now we're coming in and create a plan. And our whole process is the plan's worthless if we don't execute, of course, right? And so then we've got a whole methodology of literally executing and helping and they don't owe any accountability to us, but we know that's one of the big value adds we bring is creating the accountability and the process to actually execute what they said they wanted to get done. Yeah, yeah, and we'll we'll come back to the uh, the execution and the and the back end, but um, yeah, I think to this point around strategic thinking and and sort of always be paying attention to those things. I I, I like to say all of your strategies based on assumptions. You want to test some of them but you always want to be aware that they're always just assumptions and they might what was true today might not be true tomorrow and you've got to always be kind of hold them lightly uh and paying attention to what might change them um that's a great point you know and well, certainly some of the pushback we get sometimes is oh i can't plan you know everything's changing you know, like in this current environment for sure right everything and it is but you do need to plan we need some direction you know the, the old adage of you know if, if you if you don't if you don't set sail to a direction, any wind will do and you'll end up anywhere. Well, that's not what anybody wants, right? We right. do want to end up somewhere. So have the guts to say where you want to land and then we'll start stepping back to go, how do we get, you know, it's roadmap stuff, right? How do we get there? And you, to your point, yes, you're going to make assumptions totally. But if we do a little bit of investigation, a little bit of research and we keep practicing at it, right? It's iterative. You don't build a plan and then you're done. It's like, it's iterative. We go, we plan, we, we go act, we learn, we, we adopt, we go back and act, we learn, right? You know, and it's this air to pro and pretty soon a team that gets into that kind of rhythm over the course of two or three years, they get pretty good at predicting and making yeah. assumptions because they just get better at it. Yeah. Go, All right, well, we're not doing that again. That was, that was pretty stupid, but, but we learn. Yeah, and taking that taking that sailing, uh, you know, wind analogy a little further, right? You you're, you're you might have the assumption the wind's at your back, and then all of a sudden it's at your front. Well, you're just going to have to tack more, right? But you still know where you want to go. Um, That's right. 
a different yeah. path to get there. So you, you talked about some of the conversations you have to kind of get the ball rolling, to get the thought process going. Um, there's a lot you can immerse yourself in to get all the inputs needed. You know, as you talked about, talk to employees and customers and competitors. How do you, how do you make sure that the team and the process and the leaders have the right inputs before they start making their, their commitments? Yeah, you know, I don't know that we do it perfectly, Jamie. Um, when we go off to draft a, a, the, the first run of a strategy, we spend two days. And that first day, uh, probably all the way up until the end before we really start digging into their strategy is a, a, a lot of either reviewing things like we just talked about, right? You just mentioned whether customer surveys, employee surveys, um, competitive analysis, financial uh, understanding. I'm probably no surprise to you. you. It's amazing how little people understand how their businesses make and lose money and where they have horrible black holes of money just leaking out of the organization. Um, and it's not because people aren't smart. It's because they're running. They're not thinking. Somebody hasn't stopped to slow down so they literally can speed up. You got to slow down to speed up. So slow down. Like, let's look at what's happening. So I, we feel like a day is about good. It sets that stage. We've done, a, we've done some theory. We've, we've educated. We've talked about things like, let's talk about what is strategy. Where are we trying to get to? Um, what are some examples of it in companies? Um, you know, one of the stories we love to share is, is uh, the, the Blockbuster story. When we get people thinking about don't think you can just stay the same. You can't. Here's a $16 billion organization that owned the video market. And, you know, guys, yours and my age all can remember what it was like before Blockbuster, you know, when the mom and pops, and then they got a little bit, you know, some, some people figured out locally how to get a few of those stores together and they had their little chain and then got to be some regional chains like Hollywood or whatever. But none of them had current releases, and that was what the market wanted, right? Voice of the customer. I want a current release. Well, pay 20 bucks to the deli guy and tell me when it comes in is about the only way you're going to current release. And here comes Blockbuster with an idea of, well, how can we get them? And the big fear, if you remember when we were kids, they thought the theaters were going to go out of business. The video stuff takes off. We're out of business. The movies will never you know, be done. Of course, you know, other than COVID, the theaters are having record-breaking years, year after year. Um, and what they realized is the theaters were, were, or the studios were worried about losing the revenue opportunity. So Blockbuster cut a deal with, hey, we'll do a revenue share deal with you and walk in any Blockbuster and along the left-hand wall was current releases, 10 movies and 100 movies each or whatever. Yep. And then of course, then the whole rest of their play of the Serpentine walk through and pick up all the rest of the videos. This grows to be a, you know, a $16 billion organization but they did two things that torqued people off. And one of them is just hilarious because you think, geez, we couldn't find a video before. And now we were moaning and groaning that we had to go drive a mile or two to get to Blockbuster. So here comes this little company called Netflix who says, well, what if we mail them to you? And if you remember, that was pretty cool. Like US mail, I get. And then they did one of the critical, important, strategic. This is important to know, I think, for the audience. Sometimes strategy is incredibly brilliant. Sometimes it's the obvious because you listen, you ask your customer and you listen. And Blockbuster ticked off their customers because they charge late fees. And part of their strategy was go get your current release and then walk through and you go, oh, geez, I haven't seen Block or uh, Ghostbusters in a while. I haven't seen Animal House. And you pick up that big wad of videos and you go home and, oh, geez, I didn't look them. We'll keep them one more night. We'll keep, yeah. And then you go back eventually, there's your late fee. So, We'll mail them to you and won't charge late fields. It was brilliant. And they take off like a rocket ship. And this is pre-internet, right? So, and Netflix is a wholly different company again today. But during this period, they're playing that move. And, and, and um, they get into financial trouble, go down to Texas to meet with Blockbuster. And obviously, you probably know the rest of the story. Blockbuster is not interested, doesn't really believe the market's going to go to the internet. It can't happen, which is kind of unfathomable today. But that's the decision. And... Uh, Netflix goes home and goes, all right, well, we got to figure it out, which they do. And of course, the internet catches up, things go, video, you know, go, go online and that whole business takes off. Netflix is a wholly different company now today. They decided to go into content. In the meantime, Blockbuster is crashing because the online is growing. 
And yet another company comes in called Redbox, right? With a pretty kind of clever vending machine technology and stick it in the middle of a bunch of where people are who wanna make impulse purchases and build a $4 billion business. Mm -hmm. It's just an example of listening to the customer. How do we adapt? What's gonna be our play? Um, you can't sit still. That's really the message. You, somebody wants your lunch. Big companies, little companies, gotta keep moving. Yeah, that's a, that's a good example. You can follow that whole whole market. And of course, what we're seeing today is what what is either a temporary shift or perhaps a permanent shift in, in how that, that need is fulfilled. Um, and, it, and it really, you know, those are, those are interesting contrasting examples of what, what was working and are we willing to uh, somewhat sacrifice what was working to shift to something new or aren't we? Um, and, and that's always a challenge for a lot of companies. How much should what we do today anchor or affect what we want to do in the future, right? It, it should have some relevance, otherwise you might as well just start a new business. And if it has too much relevance, as in the Blockbuster example, then you never do anything you know, dramatic and new and different. So, so how do you weigh how much that the current organization, assets, people, capabilities, markets, should affect your strategy going forward. Wow, yeah, and now throw family business on top of it and, and it's even more sticky, right? You know, mm -hmm. one of the big challenges for family businesses is they become enamored with the family business. And our job is as much as we love those family businesses, get enamored with business, business. So easy for two guys sitting here in a podcast to say this, I get it, it's hard when you're in the seat. That is why having a good strategic planning process, not with just the CEO figuring it out, with a leadership team that the CEO understands his or her biggest job is developing that leadership team to be smart, intelligent leaders, people that can predict, that can lead, be good leaders, right? And can, and can delegate, though, and, right? So now we got people who are looking out at the marketplace or looking at what's going on, and it can build strength in that team that they can have good debate and dialogue so they can say the market's changing. And, and, and they, it's, it's the confronting the brutal facts. You know, it's old Stockdale stuff. It's, it's hard stuff, but that's the, the whole thing kicks off with the strategic planning, you know, thinking and process and then building a plan. The, the, the beauty of it is if you get this institutionalized in your business, you start taking on those, those sacred cows and they're sacred, it's hard. It's hard to walk away from something that's working, mm -hmm. really hard, but um, you gotta, it, and now you, it, it, you're getting better as a company and you're, and you're really understanding markets and you're understanding data. And back to your point where you started this podcast off, so you're gonna make assumptions and they might be wrong. And I think it's also having the guts to go, that's bad, we, we missed it. We got it right. So you're measuring. You're 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 not just taking a, a flyer and then you don't you don't measure and check. And you gotta have the guts and the and the humility to come back and go. Either we nailed it or we missed it and we adjust again. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard. It's hard work. But that's the work of leadership. Yep. And if you have a good leadership team and you keep developing that team, um, I think you got a shot at taking on those those shifts that we invariably pretty much every company's got to make. Mm -hmm. even in its one generation, but certainly multi-generationally. Right. No, I think you're right. It does, you know, it, it does, the family business does add that dynamic where you sort of say, well, this is what, what grandfather wanted and, and he's not with us. So we can't ask him if he's willing to abandon that. So you feel obligated and uh, certainly can, can hinder uh, uh, real shifts and in, in what needs to happen. So, so transitioning a bit to, you know, having a strategy to how we go drive it, um, you know, what is the, the best way to communicate that strategy uh, to everyone? Does everyone need to understand it? How much do they need to understand? And how do you get that communication uh, out, out of the process? Yeah, I think everybody needs to understand it to some degree. And I think they want to. I think mean, let's assume for the most part, you've built a company with the right people in it. Most every company we meet, that's not the situation. They, and it's not that anybody's wrong or a bad person. They're probably people on that team that are not aligned to the core values. 
and also probably not competent in their position. And for one reason or another, nobody's done anything about it. Not fair to the employee and not fair to the business. We'll help them kind of navigate through that. But let's get to like, hey, we've got a, 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 a company of employees who, who are the right people and on the bus and we're trying to go in the same direction. They do want to know what the direction is. And I think from a general standpoint, they don't want to know all the details. The leadership team better know all the details. They're the ones that built the dang thing. They better know it inside and out. As we move back here, if people have an understanding, first of all, what's the vision? What's, what a game are we trying to play? Where are we trying to get to? And we like to play off of um, Jim Collins, good to great, and the, the BHAG, the big, hairy, audacious goal. Um, I love that because it's a goal. Like we actually set a number or something we could measure. Sometimes it's revenue. Um, sometimes it's, uh, you know, maybe number of customers, something that you could measure and people can go, hey, here's where we are. And that's where we're trying to go. I think in saying that really quickly, most employees could really care less about revenue. Then the ownership and revenue not just being that doesn't mean anything if we don't have profit with it in cash. So, right, we, that's right. another conversation. But, but you can find interesting ways to share a vision that has a revenue number tied to it that does nothing. We don't talk about the money. We we had a client who they were uh, they extruded vinyl railing uh, in the, in the business, and the the business's goal over the next five years or something was to double the size of the business. And the short of it is, as we kept talking about what that meant, we understood what the dollar amount meant, but like, again, not very inspiring. Pretty much everybody in the plant floor was going to go, oh, great. So we're going to work hard so you guys could get rich. That's that message. And that's not the message we want, right? We want to build this great company. And we want to share the wealth and etc. So we kept talking and what we learned was, hey, when we sell that much vinyl, it's this amount of linear feet and that plus or minus stretches from New York City to LA. And that became the BHAG. Mm -hmm. By 2030, we're gonna extrude enough vinyl in one year, it's gonna stretch from New York to LA. And right now we're in Edison, New Jersey. Everybody got it. And now we're going West. And every year at Christmas time, they'd have a, 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 a uh, drawing for four people, all expense paid to wherever we were on the map. <laughs> that year. So everybody was engaged. Everybody was having fun. They all went and had a blast. Their whole job was don't get thrown in jail and get back safe. And, and they had this big map up on the, on the, out on the plant floor of the United States and where we were in the trail. That's inspiring. That's like, um, you know, that's what we're doing. And mm -hmm. then combine that with core values and core purpose. And yeah, you, you got a pretty strong organization at that point. So I think at that level, having some view, and maybe these are sort of the main strategic moves we're gonna make. They're gonna get us there. Okay, I'm good. Now we come in narrow, we've got department heads, probably more of understanding the strategy and what's your role. And ultimately in our play, we take, you know, that, ten, that, that 20, I'll be out here, that North Star 20 years, 10, 20 years, three year strategic moves, still very strategic. What do we wanna accomplish this year? What are we doing this quarter? And in there, who's doing it? What are we doing by when? And we limit the number of moves that we're gonna make, right? Cause that's, that's the next problem. Once we finally is doing strategy, then we're doing a million things and then nothing's getting done. So no, narrow it down. That's where we wanna go. Here's where we wanna be in three. Here's what we're gonna do in one year to move us towards three. What do we do first quarter? And we get into that rhythm, right? And accountability and then meet on a monthly basis. Where are we? Who's stuck? What do you need? What's gonna get us the next 60 days to get to the end? You get that rhythm in there and you start teaching that team. If you got a team that'll start going across aisle and holding each other accountable, that's a really strong team. And that's again, easy say, hard do, but we're, 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 we're working with them to do that because those teams win. You know, that's the, that's the guard that goes down and plays a post position because the guy fell on the floor and he's got to go up against a seven foot center, but he's just doing it because it's his teammate. That's what he needs to do right now in the moment. Mm -hmm. You get that working in a business environment, man, you can get things done. And as long as everybody understands what we're doing, which you take it to the quarter, we know exactly what we're doing, who's doing it and by when. So. Yeah, I think that that whole execution piece becomes, you know, super important as you as you lay that out, you know, the accountability, which I think is is key. Um, you know, so I, I, I like to distinguish, you know, 
the strategic intent from the strategy. The strategy is what you've actually done, whether it's what you intended or it was by accident of a bunch of actions or a bunch of inactions. The strategic intent was what you wrote down as your plan. And the only way they're the same thing is through that accountability and through that right. execution. So uh, really important to get that right. Otherwise, the most brilliant strategy, the most brilliant strategic intent in the world doesn't produce any results. Yeah, they just look nice on your bookshelf back there in the corner. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or up on PowerPoint. So it was a really interesting conversation. I appreciate the, the examples, the stories, the analogies. Um, uh, sharing your experience working with especially family held businesses and and what it means to to turn strategy into something that that is useful for the for the company so thank you very much good good to be here jamie thanks thanks for what you're doing this is great stuff great